And so exactly what Jesse said, um, I am a, a gigantic advocate of, of questions. And so throughout this whole deal, please ask questions and that'll actually kind of help me uh, direct where I go with this uh, little seminar tonight. Uh, and so a couple disclaimers that I want to make right before we start all this is I am by no means any kind of a feed rep. And so I will use some kind of brand specific uh, examples tonight just to kind of explain how things work. Um, but no, I'm, we're going to keep it pretty broad spectrum here tonight. And I think uh, the main thing that I wanted to take uh, this advanced swine nutrition uh, seminar, the, the way that I wanted to make this work is uh, there's a lot of questions out there as far as how different nutrients are, are digested, how different feed supplements actually work. There's about 7 million feed supplements that you can feed. Um, and so hopefully through tonight, uh, my goal is, is that you'll have a brief understanding of actually how things work and actually what's in your feed and how it actually benefits your swine project. Um, so that's kind of the disclaimer there. And so actually I'm going to start the same way that I started there on Monday. Um, with just kind of some basic stuff. Uh, you probably saw there in the, in the flyer for this, we called it advanced monogastric nutrition. And so as far as what is a monogastric, uh, it's, uh, as compared to ruminants, ruminants have four compartments to their stomach, uh, hogs and, and monogastric, uh, animals in general have one compartment to their stomach and uh, quite frankly it's actually pretty similar to us. Uh, hogs actually digest nutrients and uh, pretty darn similar to, to how we um, digest food as well and so a lot of the things that we're going to talk about tonight actually can be to an extent related back to even how we uh, can manage ourselves nutritionally. Obviously we aren't going to eat soybean meal, obviously we aren't going to eat paleen um, things of that nature, but uh, we would actually digest them relatively close to the same. So that's kind of one interesting point there. Uh, so some basics. This is what I want everybody to start out on is as far as uh, what we're going to talk about tonight uh, are the six classes of nutrients, okay? Uh, water, protein, lipids. I'm going to actually put up the chat box here, here real quick. Well, maybe not. That was just me, Colby, posting the link for Monday. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. No worries. Um, anyway, uh, water, proteins, uh, lipids, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. Okay. And so that's uh, the big thing. Those are what we're going to talk about predominantly tonight is uh, how each of those nutrients affect stuff. The one thing that I'm not going to talk about in, in a very high density is water. However, don't get it misconstrued. Water is absolutely 100%, no questions asked, the most important thing uh, to any living being. That is the single most important nutrient. And so, you know, as you guys are, are feeding and preparing uh, your swine projects, make sure uh, water, fresh, clean water is available to those guys at, at all times. Um, and then we're going to go over some objectives here in just a second. Uh, but one of the big things that we're going to talk about tonight that's actually very, very prominent to hogs in general is protein. And so we're going to break down protein quite a bit tonight. But objectives for this evening, um, what is important to have in your feed? That's something that I hope you guys understand uh, by the time we're done. Uh, some very important things to look for in your hog feed, uh, no matter what you're feeding. All right. Uh, we're going to break down some of those feeds and supplements and talk about what makes them work. Uh, what are um, the, the physiological effects of those, all right? And then the, the other thing that I want everybody to get out of uh, this little seminar tonight is, is kind of just some real basic strategies uh, in feeding your hog projects. Uh, and so we're gonna, I've got some pictures, uh, things of that nature. And we kind of went over that a little bit there on Monday as well. And so uh, for those of you that are interested, as Jesse said, she posted that uh, uh, link to YouTube for Monday. And so if there's some things that you want to go back over, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, the other caveat that I'm going to put to this is there is some rather advanced uh, type stuff in here. And so uh, again, if anybody has any kind of questions, uh, please feel free to ask them uh, throughout the deal. I'll, I'll stop uh, in the middle if we need to and answer that particular question. But the big uh, thing that we're going to go through here now, uh, we need to talk about uh, 
protein, all right? And so one of the very first things that we're going to talk about here is uh, what protein is made up of. And, and for those of you that might be a little bit older that have taken a, a biology class or something of that nature, uh, protein is made up of uh, amino acids. Amino acids are pretty darn important. And as a matter of fact, hogs do not need protein. Hogs need amino acids. Um, and so amino acid content is actually very, very important. And so as we go through this first table here, the first one that I want to bring your attention to is lysine. Lysine is uh, what's called a limiting, or a limiting amino acid. And so I have a uh, picture here, I believe, on the next slide that actually talks about what we call Liebig's barrel. Um, and I'll explain that here in just a little bit. But as we follow through this chart, these, these numbers that you see here are actually a percent of the entire diet. And so if we start looking at um, hogs in the body weight of 8 to 13 pounds, pretty freshly newborn hogs, um, and even up, upwards into uh, the 80 pound range, we're talking about a percent and a half down to a percent uh, of lysine. And if you think of an entire protein being made up of hundreds of amino acids in some cases, to actually have a, a full percent of that protein being lysine is actually quite a bit. Um, and the reason that amino acids are so important uh, to hogs is because they can't synthesize amino acids on their own to an appreciable amount. Uh, so if we start thinking about, uh, let's just say cattle or goats or sheep, the ruminant animals, they are really, really cool. Ruminants are fascinating to me, but ruminants are cool because they can actually synthesize their own amino acids to at least some extent. Hogs cannot do that. We have to dietary or they have to be supplemented through the diet. Um, in order for them to further synthesize uh, the amino acids that they need. And so lysine is incredibly important to them, okay? Uh, and the other one that I wanna draw your attention to, and even though it's not actually as far as a recommendation in the highest amount, and, and I guess I should put a caveat to this table, uh, these are recommended amounts, a recommended minimum, or recommended amounts uh, for each stage of growth. And that's one thing that I want everybody to understand as well. Nutritional needs change um, throughout the growth phase and throughout uh, the entire lifespan. And so uh, if you even notice, we start talking about, I'm actually going to min minimize this here real quick. Uh, you start looking at 190 to 250 pound hogs on this far right or yeah, far right side of this table. Uh, lysine needs and, and really just amino acid needs in general are actually pretty far down. Uh, they don't need as much. It's a lot the same as humans. Uh, as humans, uh, we need nutrient-dense feed or food uh, when we're younger. Hogs are the exact same way in order to get skeletal growth. And we're actually going to talk about that probably just a shade more here, uh, specifically once we talk about fat later on. But lysine, very important. And the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is even though it's not at a high amount, methionine is another very, very important amino acid. That's what's considered the second limiting amino acid uh, to hogs. And so when you start looking at your feed tags and putting this in a practical perspective, um, making sure you monitor the lysine content of each of these feeds as well as methionine content, that's pretty darn important. Uh, and so, to further understand um, what limiting amino acids mean, this is what's called Liebig's barrel. And so, this is how amino acid th synthesis works. And actually, this is pretty interesting, these barrels right here are actually probably more closely represent a chicken uh, because methionine is their first limiting amino acid, lysine is their second. If you flip-flop that, that would be hogs. So we're going to pretend that LYS is down here, MET is up here. And so how Liebig's barrel works and how limiting amino acids work in general is if you think of a barrel, the lowest stave on a wood barrel is as far as we can fill that barrel. And so we put it into an amino acid perspective if we do not have enough of a lysine content closer to how we have over here, if lysine is not at a high enough content, 
none of these other amino acids, as far as the other staves of this quote unquote barrel, uh, you can't synthesize the rest of those amino acids and the body does not function at a proper rate. And same thing with methionine. If let's say we rise lysine up to methionine's rate, then guess what? We still cannot fill that barrel to the fullest extent. And so in order for a hog to function properly and, and be what I would just deem as a healthy animal in general, we have to have the proper amount of lysine. We want to be right here, okay, uh, as well as methionine. Those are the two limiting amino acids. And so uh, that is why it is critically important that hogs have an appreciable amount of lysine within their diet and, and stay pretty close to those, um, those recommendations. Now, with that being said, most of the time, all of our quote unquote show pig feeds should be pretty well balanced for that. Uh, it's when you start wanting to uh, kind of mix your own feed and stuff of that nature that you need to pay very, very close attention to that. And like, as I said before, um, tonight's goal is that you can have a further understanding of, of actually how these, how these different aspects work. I think that's one of the most important things of just uh, this program in general is understanding how uh, nutrition actually works. So we'll actually go on to the next slide, slide here. And this is uh, a slide that I find to be incredibly interesting. And this is actually where um, it becomes a little more practical as far as feeding and managing hogs, specifically show pigs, to look like the desired effect that we want them to look like, okay? And so we have high lean gain, medium lean gain, low lean gain. And so more so than anything, what this does, this particular chart can actually give you a little bit of a direction of uh, how you want to develop your feed. And so um, if we were to look at, uh, for instance, if we have more of a uh, quote unquote a lighter muscled hog, And so if let's just go over to our finishing stage here of 190 to 250 pounds over there on the far right side, um, lysine is actually uh, between bears and gilts, quite frankly, or quite easily to see, much higher than a low lean gain. Again, we have to have that much lysine and protein, uh, or just amino acids in general, in order to develop tissue. Okay, specifically muscle tissue. And so that's why this high lean gain, all of these particular amino acids are much higher. Okay, uh, and so I think this is a pretty valuable chart. I'm not going to go through and, and, you know, necessarily explain and read out everything. Uh, the other thing, though, that I do want to draw attention to is if we go over here to our, our sex uh, effect as far as barrows and gilts, uh, if you notice, once we actually go over to specifically, our finisher stage, gilts are actually much higher, or they have a much higher requirement for lysine. And so the reason for that um, is, I'm sure for those of you that have, have fed a lot of hogs and have been around the pig deal for a while, gilts physiologically are heavier muscled than what barrows are at heavier weights. And so because they are heavier muscled, they have a higher lysine requirement. Uh, because amino acids, once again, make up protein, protein makes up muscle. And so this is a pretty valuable chart. Like I said, again, uh, for those of you that go back, back and look through this again, uh, and I can actually share this PowerPoint as well, uh, check out that uh, this particular chart or table, I guess, uh, because there's a lot of really valuable things on here. I want to go back to this as well, and this is probably a little bit, uh, I use this on Monday as far as a, a basic chart um, in regards to where you need to be as far as protein percentage levels. And one thing that I did not mention, uh, most of our hog feeds we refer to right off the bat as, as by their protein content. Uh, you don't hear many people say a grower and a finisher per se. A lot of people say, I think that hog needs to be on an 18% protein. I think that hog needs to be on a 20% protein, uh, something like that. You know, they're, they're specifically talking about the, the protein content of that feed. And so I think this is also a pretty good chart in regards to um, where you can expect to be uh, as far as protein content of feed. Uh, throughout the feeding period, all right? 
And so if we look here, and one thing that we really didn't talk about earlier as well, again, we're going to talk about it more in depth once we get to the fat section. Uh, but while we're talking about protein, young livestock in general, the most single most important thing, obviously, besides water, uh, to get skeletal growth and, and, and to get those animals to grow up, essentially, is protein. And so, like we said earlier, hogs don't need protein, they need amino acids. But to further break that down, uh, let's just say, for instance, a, a feed with a content of 0.95% lysine, that's going to be upwards of a, probably a 18 to 19% protein. That's a rough correlation, but that's about what it goes to. So uh, for further example, something with a, a 0.85% lysine, we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 15% protein as far as dietary content of that feed. And so uh, I think that's a valuable chart there where my mouse is going. And then as well, you can start to expect uh, or you can start to see what we expect out of these hogs as far as average daily gain. Again, I'd encourage everybody to go back and watch the, the Monday's session uh, to kind of talk about average daily gain and feed to gain what you can expect out of those hogs. Tonight we're going to talk more so on what is needed um, or how, how these nutritional components work. So I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next slide here. One thing that I want to talk about, and actually a very, very hot topic uh, within the hog industry right now, is paline, ractopamine. Okay, uh, ractopamine is actually uh, the actual ingredient that makes up the brand name paline. And so uh, the reason it's a hot topic right now is, is apparently China does not want um, paline fed hogs anymore. And so on a commercial level, that's actually kind of eradicated. Luckily, on a show pig standpoint, uh, in not all states, but a lot of them, we still get to use paline. And I think it's a good product. Now, here are some things as far as uh, things to be careful of and, and actually more so, again, how it works uh, within the animal. And so what ractopamine is, um, is it's a, a beta agonist. And so what that means is it actually repartitions um, and redirects nutri nutrients that would normally be stored as fat tissue and, and actually increases lean development. So it, it basically changes how nutrients are actually absorbed, which is really cool. Uh, ractopamine is a fascinating thing. Uh, and some of you that might be in the cattle deal uh, may have heard of products like Zilmax or... Um, uh, shoot, I can't remember the other one, but uh, that's ractopamine. Zilmax is ractopamine for those of you in the cattle industry. Um, but that's exactly what it does is, is redirects nutrients uh, to increase lean gain as opposed to fat tissue. Okay. And so essentially right there, it says increased muscle hypertrophy. And so the way uh, I got taught what hypertrophy was, uh, there's hyper or hypertrophy and there's hyperplasia. Okay. Uh, hyperplasia is an increase in the count of muscle cells. Hypertrophy is, uh, I, the way they put it to me this way is hypertrophy is, is actually growing the muscle cell itself. Hypertrophy is, is making more, uh, or hy hyperplasia, excuse me, is making more. Hypertrophy is making one cell bigger. And so uh, you see the word trophy in there. Uh, we want big trophies. That's how I remember that. Uh, that that's, it's making the muscle cell bigger. And so kind of how it works there to an extent is not only does it repartition nutrients, it also induces the muscle cell to have an uptake of water. And so it, there's actually a lot of research and studies out there that say it's pretty beneficial actually to meet quality as far as tenderness. Um, and then as well, uh, intramuscular fat uh, as well, which is pretty darn interesting to me. Uh, but that's how paleen works, all right? And that's one thing that a lot of people uh, don't necessarily know. They understand that paleen will make them uh, really, really shapely, really heavy muscled. But that's exactly how it does it, all right? And then in addition to that, obviously muscle is heavier than fat. And so they get an increased average daily gain and then also an increased feed efficiency. And so there's a lot of benefits to this product. One thing that I do want to caution on, and you can go back and listen to my talk there on Monday as well. 
one thing that oh whoops that uh, I want to talk about specifically and these pictures help um, help my point quite a bit is paling is not for every project by any stretch uh, paling in the wrong hands and in the wrong dosage can actually be quite dangerous uh, because if uh, you think about a really really uh, heavy muscled bodybuilder they do not have the same function as being able to move um, as what let's just say a marathon runner does okay uh, muscle can actually tie up a skeleton a little bit and actually hinder structure and within uh, the show pig world right now structure is so paramount uh, very very important and so paling is not for every project and so I wanted to talk about these two pictures specifically this top picture here that would be a hog that I would not deem as a candidate for paling. Muscle is not an issue in that hog. Paling is used in order to shape hogs up that might be a little bit plainer in terms of muscle shape. And they have to be plenty fat before you start worrying about paling. Paling is usually done within the last 30 to 21 days of the feeding period. Past that can uh, have detrimental effects depending on who's feeding it and there's some experienced guys that I know will feed it longer than that but just for the general idea uh, the last 30 to 21 days and again they have to be pretty pretty chubby in order to still make hogs look right in addition to that I, I think it's very very important to understand structure and for those of you who might not have taken a livestock evaluation course or class or something of that nature in the past highly encourage you to do so uh, very very valuable because that also helps you. This would be another hog that I would never feed paling to because he's far too straight there in his hip, or I'm guessing, no, that is a barrel, yeah, there in his hip and his hind leg. And so once you start feeding paling to hogs uh, that their skeleton is already questionable, you put that much weight and that much muscle mass on a frame that is not built to handle it, uh, you, can, you can mess them up pretty bad. And so I'd be pretty careful there. However, a hog like this, this old guilt right here, I want everybody to pretend that she's a shot younger. Obviously, uh, that's a guilt that's, that's plenty old. Um, but she is a little bit fatter. We can tell that through her jowl or her jawline. Uh, and she's a little bit plainer in terms of muscle shape than what this Yorkshire Barrow is up here. That guilt, in terms of feet and, and skeletal quality, uh, she looks to be relatively sound structured. And so she might be a candidate that we could maybe feed uh, paleen to. Again, uh, I know we're talking about nutrient uh, physiology and how they work, but I wanted to get paling in here uh, mainly just to uh, educate further on how it works and understanding that, that paling is not for every project. But again, a very valuable uh, tool and as well, um, now we have a better understanding of what ractopamine actually does. So now we're gonna talk about fat. Um, and I guess before I move on, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to go over before I go any further? If none, we'll keep on going here. Um, but as far as fat, all right, and again, uh, if I'm talking, don't feel or don't hesitate to, to stop me and, and ask questions here. But as far as fat, okay, uh, here's some big things here. Um, at young ages, feeding supplemental fat is actually could be pretty detrimental to growth. I said earlier that we need to feed nutrient dense feed uh, to baby livestock, mainly just from the standpoint that, that they need to grow. We're trying to get those hogs to, to grow up and reach a, a weight rather fast. However, fat does not get you necessarily weight. Um, there's actually, this is kind of interesting, uh, I read a paper not too long ago about this, that there's actually an inverse relationship of protein content and digestible energy. That's what DE is. You see DE, that's digestible energy. And so as protein goes up, digestible energy actually goes down. Um, and so lipids or fats, uh, their physiological food value and so what I mean by that is actually how much, how dense nutritionally uh, that nutrient is. Lipids are nine calories per gram. And so actually here's just a, an interesting thing here. Uh, I, I challenge all of you to go look at a food label. And um, 
I want you to look on there and notice that the calories is spelled with a capital C. That is for a very specific reason because you notice the, the K cal here. If we were to write it in, in human terms, that would be a regular C. If you ever see little C calories, uh, lowercase C calories, that is one single calorie. The calories that we worry about are, are kilocalories or capital C calories, all right? And that's how livestock feed is, is measured in as well, sometimes even mega calories in some cases. Um, but, and the reason that, that they are written that way is one calorie to us, little c calorie, mind you, uh, really is, is nothing. Okay. And so, uh, for instance, if we were to look at a, at a Mountain Dew bottle, I don't have any food in, near me, but, um, if we were to look at a Mountain Dew bottle, a lot of the time it might say, I think, I don't know, 120 calories or something like that. Killa is a thousand of, of one. All right. And so big C calories, if we were to write that, if we were to write that Mountain Dew label, or I hope I'm explaining this. Okay. I know I'm kind of bouncing around, but if we were to write that in little C calories, it would be 120,000 calories. Obviously from a marketing standpoint, that does not look that good. And so 120 kilocalories is actually what we're consuming. So that's what lipids are. One gram of, of a lipid is nine kilocalories, okay? And so when we start talking, and that's specifically talking energy, okay? Uh, and so as protein content goes up, digestible energy will go down. And as younger hogs, that is okay. We actually want that because again, protein is what allows for growth to occur. And that's why a lot of our starter feeds and uh, our, our growing hog feeds are upwards in that 18 to 20% protein, okay? We don't need digestible energy just yet because digestible energy specifically, um, energy in general is what actually puts on fat. And so as we start getting older, or I guess I'm, I'm not gonna move on from the, the detrimental to growth yet, um, because if we start ramping up fat at a young age, naturally our protein content is going to go down so that's what actually will will stuff up our hogs growth and they won't actually get near as big as what we need them to to get to a market weight of the 270 pounds or whatever our ideal endpoint is all right uh, just in general as we start getting into later stages of growth fat supplementation uh, obviously helps with softening their look and in today's hogs they need to have some some belly they need to have some rib and so that's where fat helps us out. And then in addition to that, just from a, a market perspective beyond the show ring, uh, fat's what makes stuff taste good. Uh, for a long time, uh, the loin was the highest per pound priced uh, meat cut in hogs. That is not the case anymore. Bacon on a per pound basis is actually the highest priced. You can't get good bacon without them being chubby enough. Okay, and so fat is still important. I know I, I made fat sound real evil and bad uh, young stages, but once we start getting into our finishing stages of growth, fat is very, very important. And so in addition to that, fat is a storage of energy. And so when we start talking about, you, I'm sure most of you have heard judges talk about freshness and, and things of that nature, because fat is a store of energy, uh, it's pretty beneficial in keeping hogs, quote unquote, looking fresh. Okay. And then the other thing at finishing stages of growth, the interesting thing about fat is it actually moves through the digestive system at a much slower rate. And so as it moves through the digestive system at a slower rate, it actually aids in digestion uh, of other nutrients. And so you notice that note that I have down there at the bottom, that extra metabolic effect or extra caloric effect is another way to put it. Um, we're actually getting, uh, a very, we're actually helping those hogs digest feed at a more efficient rate with fat supplementation in hogs. For those of you that, that show ruminant species and, and jump on to uh, the ruminant talk next week, uh, ruminants are a little bit different in that effect. Fat can actually downgrade their ability to digest uh, nutrients at an efficient rate, but we'll talk about that next week. Um, but yes, you're actually getting more energy and caloric intake with fat because it's actually aiding in digestion with other nutrients. And so that's one cool thing about fat there. 
Pokemon. All right, and so moving on from fat, I know uh, looking at my clock here, uh, I, I want to leave plenty of time uh, to answer questions, and so we're going to kind of hustle through uh, this a little bit quicker, and I'm, I'm getting close to the end. Um, one thing that's actually really important here is as far as vitamins and minerals. Uh, if you ever want to hear me really nerd out, talk to me about vitamins and minerals because I think they're really, really cool. Um, specifically, one interesting thing about hogs is uh, as baby pigs, when they are newborn, uh, all hogs are born anemic, which means they have an iron deficiency. And so if you notice at a parts per million, iron is at very, very high rates, specifically at a young age. Hogs have to be supplemented with iron because they do not have it, um, as opposed to other species uh, that are not born anemic. They actually have an, an, an adequate amount of iron within their body uh, at a young age. Hogs are born without it. And so we have to supplement iron. And actually most breeders, if they're doing the correct job, I will give iron shots as, as baby pigs. The other thing that I want to bring attention to that's pretty important is, and we're going to talk about this a ton when it comes to ruminants because it's very fascinating, um, but vitamin B12, making sure you have a proper amount of vitamin B12 uh, within an animal's diet uh, is pretty darn important because vitamin B12 uh, plays a very active role in what's called gluconeogenesis. And so if you break that word down uh, in Latin, I guess, uh, genesis means new um, and uh, making of new. And then gluco is short for glucose, which is the very basic level sugar within our entire body. Gluconeogenesis is the making of new glucose. Hogs do not do that to an appreciable extent. They do a little bit, hogs and humans alike. We can make a little bit of glucose within our body. Um, ruminants are actually far more efficient at that. Uh, but anyway, vitamin B12 plays a incredibly active role in the making of new glucose and keeping energy correct and, and things of that nature. And so vitamin B12 is pretty darn important uh, as well as thiamine. Thiamine is not on here, which is vitamin B1, um, but very important. This is another valuable chart just to make sure your hog's feed is within the range of acceptability of recommended dosages um, of each of these, specifically these fat soluble vitamins as well. Uh, make sure that, that your hog's feed is within that. All right, last thing that I want to talk about here, and this is probably something that I could have talked about on the basic side of things, but while we're talking about feeding strategies in general, uh, one question that I get asked quite a bit is, are self-feeders better or are uh, limit, limit feeding hogs better? Uh, the answer is yes to both of them because they're good at different stages, okay? Very, very key thing there, at different stages. As young hogs, like right off, the, right off the bat when you're getting them home, you know, these self-feeders maybe aren't all that bad, okay? Uh, it, it gets hogs to go to feed right off the bat and understand what feed even is uh, initially. Now, once you start getting past that 60, 70, 80 pound range, my personal recommendation here is get them off that self-feeder because at that point, you need to start manipulating those hogs probably just a shade more. Um, and so limit feeding them at that point, uh, is better. One common, very common misconception is if hog or if hogs have feed in front of them all the time, then they're hungry all the time and they want to eat. That is a very, very common misconception and it's not true. Uh, hogs that you, you have to stimulate appetite in hogs. If hogs have feed in front of them all the time, they're not going to be hungry. It's no different than us at, let's just say, Thanksgiving dinner, where we have food in front of us for days. After a while, we're not hungry anymore. And so if you can keep hogs hungry by limit feeding, uh, and, and again, go back and listen to that talk that we had on Monday about, uh, you know, recommended intake as far as poundage of hogs a day. Uh, if you can keep them on the verge of being hungry, uh, a guy that I actually look up to quite a bit in the sheep world, Wade Franklin, he put it probably as good as anything I've ever heard. A hungry animal is a better animal. 
And so if you can maximize intake by keeping them hungry and making them think they're hungry all the time, that is how you maximize the amount of feed that hogs eat. And so at one point, limit feeding them is pretty darn important. Uh, a, a self feeder is great initially, but eventually once you start getting up into that upper weight range uh, of 70 to 80 pounds, you probably need to be putting them on a limit feeder, take them off of the self feeder because you will actually get them to gain more by keeping them hungry. And so that's all I have as far as that is concerned. And again, here's the ultimate goal. Uh, throughout all this is by understanding how nutrients work and understanding how different feeds work. Uh, the ultimate goal is we can get them to look like that. That's one of my favorite hogs that ever won Denver um, of the Rogers family. That one was really good, but past that, that is all I have.